Dolby Atmos for games. Is this a good idea or maybe not so much? Well, let's talk about it. But before we do that, hello everybody. My name is Michael Wagner. I teach at the Westfall College of Media Arts and Design at Drexel University in Philadelphia. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design and spatial audio. If you're interested in any of those topics, please consider subscribing and don't forget to press the like button because of, you know, YouTube algorithms. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I got a lot of questions and I haven't done a Q&A video for a while. So I thought I used this opportunity to answer a couple of questions and uh, that's what I'm going to do today. So let's get ahead with the first question. The first question is one that I'm actually getting quite often and it always goes something like this. Uh, would you be open to be hired for one to two hours? And the short answer to that question is no. And the reason for that is uh, everything that I do on this channel is actually very, very closely related to my day job. Uh, I'm actually even telling you where I work at the beginning of each video. And that essentially means that any consulting work that I would take on as a result of the videos that I do here would be considered a conflict of interest and it's just not worth doing that. Now, having said that, if you are a student at a university, college or even high school somewhere and you have some questions, feel free to reach out to me anytime. If I have the time to answer your question, I'm more than happy to do that. And I've actually done that in the past. If you are a researcher at the university or somewhere, also, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm also in, always interested in research projects and collaborations. And for anybody else, uh, please use the comment section in the YouTube channel below or uh, join my Discord server. And we, I'm more than happy to discuss any of your questions there. The second question comes from Pascal Pagnon and he wants to know, hi, can you explain if I want to edit in 7.1.4 instead? Because when I choose the bus in 7.1.4, it's not working. Only 7.1.2 does for some reason. How can I have 12 bed channel instead of 10? Now, the simple answer to the question is you can't. And the reason for that is that the Adobe Atmos specification states that an Atmos bed can have up to 10 channels, but it can't have 12. So you cannot put a 12 channel bed into an Atmos master file uh, because the specifications don't allow it. However, your question uh, opened up an interesting topic that I wanted to address briefly today. And I might actually do a little longer video in the future. And that has to deal with the way mastering is done in Adobe Atmos. To demonstrate what I mean, I've opened up a previous Dolby Atmos project in DaVinci Resolve Fairlight. And uh, this was one that I actually used for a number of videos in the past and I'm actually going to use in a future video as well. Just as a quick reminder, it was a very simple project. It contained one 10 channel Atmos bed that was essentially the drum track. And then we had eight individual Dolby Atmos objects and these were routed into the Dolby Atmos renderer to complete the Dolby Atmos setup. Now, if you look at the mixer section in DaVinci Resolve Fairlight, you will actually notice that at the master bus, which shows you the output of the Adobe Atmos renderer, there is no possibility for me to put any additional processing. So I couldn't do anything like a traditional mastering here because um, essentially it does not allow me to do that. There's no place for me to put my mastering uh, plugins or my, my, my mastering chain on there. Now, this is actually by design, and the reason for that is because of the way Dolby Atmos is distributed. Dolby Atmos is, dis is not distributed as a 7.1.4 file. It's actually distributed as an object-oriented file format that contains all the information about the bed and the objects, the individual objects. Uh, and the final rendering is actually usually done, at least at the device level. And that means that mastering has to be done differently. I cannot master the 7.1.4 output of the Dolby Atmos renderer. The mastering actually has to be done at the mixing level. So this requires requires completely new skills. And if you look at uh, some of the videos that uh, some professional mastering engineers are doing on Dolby Atmos, they will actually kind of uh, discuss this quite often that uh, by moving into Dolby Atmos, they needed to change the way their mastering process works or the mastering workflow works, because now they can no longer master the final output. They actually have to do a combination of mixing and mastering and do the mastering at the mixing stage of that, uh, of that process. And that also means that there is a completely new job description that is popping up because that is a skill that essentially sits somewhere between mixing and mastering. So it's actually an opportunity for many of you to get involved in that and maybe essentially become specialized Adobe Atmos mastering engineers. The third question comes from Jacob Richter and he actually asked that question on my Discord server. Hello there, I just followed a discussion on LinkedIn about Atmos for VR and six degree of freedom, but I don't know how to use it for that purpose, especially when you travel around. Any ideas on how Atmos is implemented in Unreal or Unity? Thanks. Now, this is a highly interesting question because Dolby has actually been pushing the use of Dolby Atmos in game design substantially over the last couple of years. So whether or not this makes sense, 
um, is, a, is actually something we should look into. Now, um, having said that, I'm a little um, cautious about, about the utility of Dolby Atmos in game design, and that has a very, very simple reason, and you hinted on that reason in your question, and that is because the way Dolby Atmos is defined. Now, first of all, we have to talk about what we actually mean by Dolby Atmos. If you think of Dolby Atmos as the final render output, uh, a multi-channel file that contains hit speakers that is sort of a 7.1.4 channel format, then yes, obviously. I mean, you would like to have as an immersed or an immersive environment as possible. And the more speakers you can have in, a, in an environment, even if it's a gaming environment, obviously kind of the better it will be. However, the question is, does the actual format make sense? And that is much, much more difficult to answer. And the reason for that is that Adobe Atmos is a combination of a channel-based and an object-based based uh, audio format and because there is a channel based com component in there it actually is limited to a sweet spot so Dolby Atmos makes a lot of sense in, in situations where you are kind of sitting still and you have your audio environment around you uh, and then essentially you want to get the best uh, perceived audio experience in that particular sweet spot. Uh, and everything is described with respect to the sweet spot. Also, the objects are actually described in relationship to the listener. Now, in co by contrast, in game design or virtual reality design, or really any application that uses six degrees of freedom, uh, all audio is object-based. And the main difference is that these objects are not described in relationship to the listener, but they're actually described in relationship to the environment. So there's a fundamental difference in the way uh, audio objects are handled in game design as opposed to Dolby Atmos. And if you would use Dolby Atmos, and by once again, by Dolby Atmos mean the actual uh, audio format, that is this combination of channel-based and object-based, you would have to convert the, um, the, op the, the way we treat audio objects in, uh, in a six degrees of freedom environment to the way Atmos treats audio objects. And I'm not quite sure if that conversion actually makes a whole lot of sense. Um, especially since if we are talking about game design, for example, the limitation of 128 or actually 118 objects that you have in Dolby Atmos is simply not enough. In, uh, in game design, we have many, many more objects. So, so um, the question whether or not the, uh, the, the Dolby Atmos makes sense as a, as, as a file format within game design is a not so easy to answer. <laughs> One, uh, it might be, um, I currently don't see it, but uh, I will probably kind of com come back to that question in the future because I could see the some potential applications of Dolby Atmos, but it's not a slam dunk as some people say. It's not that straightforward. And once again, the main reason for that is that in Dolby Atmos, the objects are described in relationship to the listener in a six degree of freedom environment, like in games or in virtual reality, the audio objects are described in relationship to the environment and the listener is moving freely. And that would mean that you would, in any case, have to do some sort of translation or transformation from the environment-based description to the listener-based description. And that is an overhead that I simply don't see why you would want to do that. Question number four is not so much a question as it is a comment that I actually got to smile quite a bit about that. And I'm going to kind of come back to that in a second when I'm essentially making my comments to that comment. Comes from Nick Nobles, uh, has to do with NFTs. And uh, he essentially writes, ah, yes, NFTs, a wonderful money, la money laundering tool. Can't wait to have them in our games as well. It will make a wonderful addition to all the microtransactions and other means of aggressive monetization in AAA games. What could possibly go wrong? And uh, there are some truth to that. Honestly, there's some truth to that. But uh, let me let me unpack that a little. First of all, let me say that, uh, you know, kind of it was very interesting to see that uh, this this video was actually one of my most disliked videos. Um, I don't really have a lot of dislikes, thankfully, but uh, essentially a lot of people did not really appreciate my my, my standpoint or my viewpoint on, on NFTs. And uh, that has to do with a very, very weird, um, you know, kind of uh, conflict between game gamers and and crypto miners uh, i am not quite sure where it comes from it is slightly strange and i might actually do a video about that in the future i think it was even picked up by some of the main media recently um, but uh, the problem with that is that it 
clouds all the possibilities that you might have. I don't see a lot of game designers, real game designers in the, in the, in the crypto space or in the blockchain space, just because of that reason. And whenever a AAA company tries to move into that, the gamers will immediately kind of become very aggressive and it says, no, don't do that. If you do, if you do that, we are going to kind of leave you and we're not, never going to play your game again. Now, um, while I do have some some um you know empathy or kind of I, I do have some understanding about why that is the case it is a little bit problematic and uh, let me tell you why um now i in order to kind of explain what i want to explain here is i need to go back in history a little it was around uh, 1992 1993 i don't remember the exact date i was working at the vienna university of technology at that time as a as an assistant really that's what i what i was doing there and i remember around that time our it department gave a presentation about what was one of the first ways to distribute information on a computer network so it was it was kind of a very early protocol that allowed you to actually kind of store information on a computer network. Uh, it was a precursor really of, uh, of what is, has become the World Wide Web. Uh, and uh, they would essentially kind of explain how all the possibilities and how cool this was and all the, all, all the what is, uh, and how this is going to change the world. And uh, I remember, I distinctively remember after that, uh, we went, uh, all, all, the, all the people from that institute went uh, for a coffee, which this is quite frankly what we do in Vienna. Uh, and uh, during that coffee break, we were completely convinced that this is one of the most stupid ideas that we've ever found. Who in the world would want to store information on a computer network? What a, what a waste of computing resources. And uh, as we all know, <laughs> we could not have been further from the, essentially the truth. Um, and essentially, we have the same thing here. Uh, the blockchain is a technology that you have to take it the way it really is. It is a computing platform that is immutable. And this computing platform allows you to do things that you could not do before. Now, do I think that the NFTs we're talking about today are going to be the big thing in the future? No, obviously not. But there will be certain applications that will revolutionize many fields in computing, including game design. And if game designers are not willing to kind of um, to kind of get into that space and start thinking about what to do with it, then essentially these decisions will be made by the people who are doing the marketing and then you will actually see aggressive monetization in NFTs that way. So I think, I think the way to, uh, to uh, essentially push that away and, 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 and completely neglect the possibilities or the potential of this technology is very short-sighted uh, and, uh, and uh, is, not, is not going to help the cause of the gamers. So uh, in that sense, yes, to some extent, I do agree with you. Essentially, if you look at the NFTs the way they are right now, this is probably what would happen, but it will happen that way because no game designer ever touches that topic. Uh, so, so please, if you're a game designer, think about what you can do with the blockchain because there's so many possibilities out there and nobody is picking them up. Now, the final question comes from Vetterly, and that was actually a comment he made to the uh, audio game audio tutorial that I put on YouTube. Uh, and he writes, um, or, or she writes, I, I, I'm sorry, in case, in case I got the gender wrong. I wish every tutorial was as easy to follow as yours. The tempo is perfect, and you pretty much answer every question, I'm assuming, that popped up into my head while watching it. Well, first of all, thank you. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, that, that is actually to some extent on, on, on purpose. Uh, you know, kind of the tempo that I'm doing is the same tempo that I usually do in my classes. And I felt that is appropriate for these types of tutorials that are a little bit more involved and that require you to actually think about it. I have a lot of joy uh, watching all these videos on YouTube that are cut and edited perfectly with all these J cuts where essentially one sentence immediately kind of uh, kind of continues with the next sentence and they are really fun to watch but i at least always found that if you really condense that information that way it's really difficult to follow because whenever i try to think about one sentence the next sentence already started so i actually on purpose edit the videos that way or actually don't edit the videos that way now that might change in the future i don't know but at the moment i think that's the best way to kind of distribute the type of content that I want to distribute and uh, you know kind of if you if you uh, got any value of that 
uh, then great. Um, and uh, once again, thank you again for that for that positive comment. And by the way, everybody who kind of kind of uh, made similar comments, thank you very much. Now, this is everything I wanted to say today. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below or join my Discord community. There's actually a very active Discord community with people helping each other out with all kinds of questions. In invite link is in the description below. And other than that, see you at the next video.